Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Yes, in my opinion, it's got to be the greatest all-round fishing show on YouTube. Now, we've put up some trout fishing venues for you, and all you fly fishermen love them. Now, those are what we call small stillwaters. High-density fish, big fish, possibly easy to catch them because they are confined in the small water. You can also get cheaper trout fishing, though, a cheaper ticket price, a day ticket price, by going to one of our national reservoirs, which are the bodies of water where we hold all the water that, that we can work into our drinking system, really. That's what the reservoirs are there for. They're stocked with trout. The trout sometimes overwinter. They're not stocked daily in a lot of places. But what a lot of satisfaction catching them, boys. Really good. And you know what? Beautiful setting. I went down to Sutton Bingham Trout Reservoir down in Somerset. I mean, I had good weather down there, but I had the wife with me and I wasn't allowed to fish. But I saw plenty of fish caught, cool. and more important, I got an exclusive, totally awesome interview with Ivan Tinsley, who's the head ranger down there. Big fly fisherman, knows what he's talking about. Here's the interview. Trust me, you guys ought to think I'm having a day at Sutton Bingham. It's a, wow, man, I was just gobsmacked with that place. I shall be going back down there, and I shall be fishing. Hopefully, I shall be catching. Good setting. Check it out. I'm sure there's a few tips in there going to help you catch a few more trout. Well, I'm here down at a beautiful reservoir for those of you who want to try a bit of a reservoir. Trout fishing, a bit of big water fishing. Fantastic day, beautiful day here. And it's in Somerset, in deepest Somerset, and uh, really, really impressive countryside. Of course, we've got an excellent day for filming. Not so great for fishing, it's bright. But with me is Ivan Tinsley, the senior ranger at the fishery. Now, Ivan's been fishing, fly fishing for something like 38 years. And he's going to give us some sort of an insight into if you were going to have a day here, how to approach it, a little bit of a history, tackle techniques, all those tips that you guys need to know. Ivan, what sort of tips can we start off with? Um, Sutton Bingham is uh, preliminarily a, a float in lime water, um, mainly um, from the start of the season, uh, a nymph water, um, and as the season uh, progresses, um, on the top fishing with small flies, diebacks, buzzers are, are a must. Um, and, and from the start, it, it's usually sort of weighted damsels, goldheads, montanas, um, hares here. And as, like I say, the season progresses, coming into late April, into May, then you most definitely need to be on the surface um, or just below. Now, what sort of uh, rod would you recommend somebody coming here? Because uh, if they go to a lot of these small put and take fisheries, obviously it's a lot easier because you're casting shorter. And if you're, say, not such a great caster, your chances are <clears throat> quite high. But on a big water, you've got to be able to get a bit of a line out. What, you know, weight lines, rods, reels would you recommend? Um, generally, it's sort of nine foot, six to ten foot. Um, depending on, on your ability to cast, but that your average sort of line is sort of a weight forward seven or eight. I personally, you know, from, from a young boy, have always used a double taper. Um, you get a better presentation on the water. And of course, you can sort of lift that double taper off to rise and fish. Um, whereas with the weight forward, you've got to bring the line back in um, before you restart. It is a much harder way of lifting off a, a, a weight forward line. Because it's heavy, all that weight's up the front, you can't really pick it up with a fly rod. No, and, and like I say, with a double taper, you can do that. Um, and like I say, when you've got rising fish, you need that ability to lift off and, and cast of the fish as well. Now I've seen, even while I was uh, uh, doing a bit of filming down by the dam earlier, um, I saw some guys and there were fish rising, let's say 20 feet to the right of them, I, they either didn't see them or they didn't pick off and cover them. So what you you would say or suggest that if you do see a rising fish, you want to get to that fish and cover it. Is that what you mean? Yeah, it, it, that's what fly fishing is about, isn't it? Is to, to you, you should be sort of looking on the water to see where the fish are. You know, fishing blind it is uh, it's okay, but you know if you can identify the way the fish are moving, which direction they're going, cast two or three sort of um, feet perhaps double that in, in front of them and I, you're guaranteed to fish to see the fly. Um, where a lot of anglers or, or new beginning anglers go wrong is, is they don't read the water correctly. Yeah. And, and, and that is all part of, of fly fishing, it, it is watching that water, seeing where the fish are. And, and if you don't lift off and cast to them, <laughs> you know, that they're, they're going to be swimming by and, and, and waving. And, <laughs> and, yeah. it, and it's down to that angler 
you know, to, to be able to um, identify those fish movements. Well, a lot of anglers always think is this, you need X tackle, or you need X rod, or you need X reel. Uh, my argument, and I don't sell fishing tackle obviously, is it's not necessarily the tackle, but it is exactly that watercraft that a lot of fishermen are missing nowadays. Would well, I be correct in saying that? That they, they should attach more to actually reading the water than worrying how far they've got to cast. Yeah, that, that's right. It, it's, I, I, I say to most people, it's the modern angler. Don't get me wrong in saying that they read the magazines and it's wrong. No, that you can get some good information from the magazines, but um, every water's different and, and you've got to you know, to catch fish, you, you've got to understand that water and, and they all fish differently um, at different times of year. Um, when it comes to tackle, um, yes, you, you, if, you, if you can afford a nice hardy rod or a Loomis, then yes, go, by all means, you know, fish it, uh, a used one. Um, but your, your average sort of fly kit, that, that there's so much on the market today that, that even an average sort of kit will, will catch you fish. It'll do um, the job, do the job for you. It does the job for you, yeah. Um, obviously, you know, the, the lines are important, that there's cheap and there's expensive lines. You know, you've got to get the line to match the rod, um, most importantly, and, and if you achieve that, then, then, you know, there's no reason why you can't get distance. Now, when I was younger, I was always told it's best to overweight a rod by about one of the, those AFTM ratings to make it cast better. What's your suggestion on that? So if you had a seven, you wanted an eight line, would that be correct or not necessarily? Not necessarily. It's all to do with um, what suits the angler. Um, here at Sutton Bingham, um, we do a lot of tuition for people. We've got various sets of rods and, uh, and lines um, that the beginner can come along and, and try. Um, and by me watching them, I can, I can see what suits that individual best. Um, you know, they, they all want to go out and buy the tackle or, or there's outfits that they can buy but it not necessarily suits that individual now you know I'm quite a tall chap quite strong in the upper body um, I can push lines out probably better th than a smaller chap like you know I mean whereas he may need a heavier line um, but it's all in, in, in the technique at the end of the day and able to use that rod and line that, that matches together um, if you can't do that then you're, you're you're starting off on, on a iffy wicket in the yeah, first place. sticky wicket, sticky wicket. Now, just looking at this reservoir around here, obviously it's in a beautiful setting. A lot of bank space, plenty of bank space. Just talk us through the different arms and the different areas that you suggest people would go and try. Okay, look, the main um, bulk of the reservoir, the dam end, this end here, where, where the water's taken off for water treatment. Um, in front of the lodge, the left-hand bank is known as the south bank, the opposite, the north bank. Um, anglers inclined to use this end more um, because it's easier access. Um, the arm of the reservoir, or the leg, um, there's no reason why the fish don't go down there. Um, the boat anglers will go down there. Um, bank angling, that they're inclined, like I say, to treat this end is that um, stock pond attitude yes, yes. where they've, they've been put in where yeah. they've been put yeah. in yeah <laughs> right. um, very few venture down there on foot and, and try you know that the areas the wilderness areas you know fish don't sort of suddenly stop off the south bank point they move down there and when this end goes off in in later summer where, where the water gets warm um, and uh, the heat retains in the water the far end there's obviously that feeder stream coming in that there's a bit of fresh water coming in that end and come October um, there are a lot of fish down that end um, finding that fresh water coming in and, and it's in the tra trout's nature to find fresh water whether it's a trickle a drip or whatever that they, they will sense the, the cleaner and fresher water where there's more oxygen and this end the bulk of the body of water here goes that little bit staler Yes. because you haven't got that um, turnover, like turnover, a turnover. No. Yeah. So, so they're inclined to move away to yeah. the fresher areas and, and anglers that come at the beginning of the season inclined to think this end here is where we stock them this is where the fish are going to end up or stay yeah. fish will move to, to their 
to the areas then where it's best for them. Is there a feeder that comes in on that other arm as well as up beyond the dam there? Yep, um, there's a small one that comes in the west pond and, and the main income of, of water is down the, the far end, the southern end of the reservoir. Now you do two tickets I understand there because it's split by what I call the, the road going across there, like the dam and the road. Yep. So Sutton Bingham is one big reservoir of whatever acreage is that and a smaller dif different day ticket system for bigger fishes. Is That's that right? right. It's something that we've brought in this season. Um, we, we've uh, There's quite a lot of people that will travel sort of up country to Wiltshire and, and even down in Devon to find the, the smaller big fish waters. The other side of the causeway there, it's about seven acres. Um, we've tried that four fish ticket this year, 40 pounds for four fish, minimum four pounds up to doubles. Um, biggest so far out of that side is 12 and a half, uh, whereas this side of the reservoir, um, the main bulk of it is 20 pounds for five fish average stock fish is about two and a quarter pounds but i do trickle feed in obviously a few bigger ones um, at the start of the season up until about june time um, the bulk of the season fish sorry the bulk of the fish for the season get put in earlier on because of the nature of the reservoir so ivan what sort of depths are there here um, out in the main reservoir and what sort of depths would you get down where the big fish are the reservoir is 143 acres in total the west pond is probably about six acres. The depth in there maximum would be around about 25 feet. Um, the main reservoir here, obviously the dam end is the deepest end. Here we're looking at sort of 40 foot. And as you go down to the southern arm, uh, anything from sort of five foot, 18 foot in the middle, obviously getting deeper as you come back through. A good tip that anglers sort of need to know when they're coming to Bingham is that um, try and sort of locate from, from an ordnance survey map um, the boundary um, Sutton Bingham sits on the Somerset Dorset border and the actual boundary as, as years gone by before it was a reservoir that the river the, the existing river that was there would have been the boundary so by looking at an ordnance survey map that would give them an idea of, of where the riverbed is and of course where you've got the river bed, you're going to have that sort of um, cold sort of stream of water. A following. bit of movement, bit, bit of movement, movement yeah. come down through. So, a, a drift from a boat down through that river system or the, the existing river system it is far better than trying to fish in the margins. That's thing. a good tip. That's a good tip, Ivan. I'm listening to that one. Yeah, if I ever get out there in a boat, that is definitely worth knowing. Now, now, you know, I think people are aware that this is a premier surface fishing reservoir, but now you've mentioned that, it's got me thinking about sinking lines. What's your take on sinking lines? What should they get? What sort of grain density to get down? How deep should they fish? If they want to start you know, looking for different fish, maybe the browns, are the browns deeper? Um, sinking lines, like I say, it's you know, mainly a floating line water. But there again, um, when it's bright and sunny like a day like today, the fish aren't going to be on the surface. They're going to be down a bit. Um, a lot of anglers sort of think of sinking lines using big flies. There's no reason why um, you can't fish a, a sinking line or intermediate and, and fish small buzzers and, and diebacks and stuff like that. Pheasant tails Pheasant or any small, small stuff. Any yeah. small stuff can be fished on a sinking line um, just off the bottom, you know, where, where the fish could be. Um, they'll, they'll be feeding um, and they not necessarily want, you know, big flies that pe fishermen associate sinking lines with. They do, you do tend to think reservoir, deep, big lures. Yeah. They're throwing things out like budgery guards, I've seen some of them. <laughs> That's you know, right. I've, I've seen there, huge there, things go out. There are times when, when the, the fish are feeding on the fry, yes, and you do need to have fry mutations. What, what fry would they have in here? Coarse fish fry? Uh, yeah, coarse fish, mainly roach fry is um, what the trout feed on. And there again, generally when, when the, the, the roach have spawned, sort of late May, early June, um, is when you'll get them come in and, and feeding on, on, on those pin fry. So quite early then really, it's not well, traditionally you think all the autumn for fry feeders, that's what I used to read in the magazines, yeah. but what you're saying is maybe June, July could be yeah, good they, for fry feeding. Yeah, they come in on, on the pin fry, um, and there again, things like uh, butcher nymph, silver and vector, that type of thing, something yeah. small. Almost like a sea trout fly there. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But, but it's that si little silver body that um, resembles the small pin fry. 
when, like I say, in the autumn when the roach have grown to about an inch, inch and a half, then you can use your appetizers I see, or yes. your polystickles or, or your, your fry imitation. The traditional fry feeders, as a lot of anglers might know them, yeah, but that pin fry, do they actually tie special flies for that? Is there, are there more patterns about or is well, it something you'd have to tie yourself? Well, I personally sort of um, tie what they call the, a, a butcher nymph, which is basically a, a butcher with the wing off it. Now, if you don't tie the nymph first, you can just cut the, the wing off a traditional butcher. Yeah. It gives you that um, silver body, the red tail and, and, and the red um, under feather it, it is the fins of the fish and, 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 it, and it, the, the black head is the, is the pin fry head. Ah, that's interesting, yeah. Now you'd fish that quite slow as well in the margins, would it's you? It's quite slow, yeah. And another pattern similar to that would be the teal blue and silver, another popular sort of fry pattern. Yes, yes. Um, that, that is where like, the anglers go wrong. Like you say, they think big all the time when it's a big thing. Trout, when the water conditions are warm, they're, they're like ourselves. We don't eat an awful lot in hot weather, and, and, and trout are very much the same. Well, most animals are, aren't they? You know what I mean? It, yeah. They'll only eat to, to um, how, how they feel uh, uh, on a particular day. That's why every day is different. Um, and anglers need to know that, that what they done yesterday, ne not necessarily is going to work tomorrow. Yeah. For them, but no two days are ever the same in any sort of fishing, are they? That's no, they're they? not. No, but. The modern angler, they do think that they, because they caught five fish, say, in front of the lodge here today, um, a week later they're back in the same spot using the same techniques and, and, and wonder why they don't catch fish. Something's um, changed. Something's yeah. changed, yeah. and it's, if the fish aren't there or they're feeding on something different, that then they've got to think and, and, and try something different. What about uh, leader strengths? Give us you know, the sort of tips on the length of leader. Can they have a straight line? Do they need a tapered leader? Uh, if you're in a boat, do you use droppers, that sort of thing? Um, leader lengths and, and, and um, strengths is down to the individual, really. Um, a lot may use a single fly and, and a tapered leader. Personally, I, I, you know, I use about an 18-foot leader with a couple of droppers, and um, I, I probably use five pounds straight through. Um, there again, it's a myth that... Um, you know, you, you've got to taper down, but it's all down to the ability of the caster. It, um, taper casters, you know, a tapered leader might help them unfold the cast a bit neater, I suppose, really. But that, if you're a good what, caster, you don't need it. No, and, and that's what it was traditionally brought out for, that tapered leader, was so that the fly would, or the line would roll out and the fly lands last thing on the water. But you get that with, with a straight through strength nylon anyway, line anyway yeah. Consider yourself a fisherman. Just how far do you want to take it? Ivan, I see you've got uh, several boats out there fishing, they're working their way, slaving their way under this uh, almost tropical sun. It's most un-British like sun, but we're grateful for it, but obviously pretty hard. How many boats have you got here? Uh, we've got a fleet of eight boats on Sutton Bingham. Um, they come into their own sort of late April, early May, when, when the fly hatches start off. Um, there again, anglers inclined to sort of use this end more so at the beginning of the year. Uh, the regulars that sort of fish the banks when they take boats out, they're inclined to go down that arm, southern arm, 
and try and catch a few of those fish that have missed the hooks this end. Um, yeah, lock, lock style is probably uh, the best way of doing it. You cover more water and um, the fish, like I say, you know, they, they don't stay in one place. So by drift fishing, you'll come across fish. And then once you've sort of found them and took a couple, um, cover your tracks again and, and, and drift through them again. Um, a lot of um, boat fishermen, like I say, just go out there, plop the anchor in and, and think that the fish are coming to them all the time. It, it's not the case. Now, are they rowing boats or are they engine boats that you run? Uh, well, they're, they're rowing boats. Um, anglers can bring their own electric outboards if they want to. Um, we permit that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's only electric outboards that, that we allow. Um, they cannot bring a, a motor engine boat. What about the dam? Traditionally, uh, in books and that, they always say, oh, you've got to get down near, near the dam, the deeper water. Does that necessarily so, you know, fishing near dams? Um, it can work. Um, most reservoirs today have got a D-strat line. Um, this is put in um, to turn the water over um, to give it a better um, temperature and quality before it enters the treatment works. When, when they turn the air lines on, when the temperature of the water rises, um, that can be quite good fishing for a period of time. Um, when they switch on, it, it brings the food off the bottom, so therefore the trout will move in on that. Is it like a circulation pump then? What does it do exactly? It, it, it's a, an air pump. It, it circulates or pushes air into the reservoir um, from the bottom, and as it rises, it turns it over. Um, that would be around the valve tower, around areas. Around the valve tower, yeah. That is, um, you'll see on your on on the on the video that uh, there's a row of boys that sort of go from the dam out into the middle of the middle of the res. That is uh, designates at the airline. Um, so uh, that that's uh, where it happens. Um, and like I say, as the summer goes on, it um, and the water warms up. As I said before, the fish will move away from this end, although it's the deepest, it's not necessarily the coolest. Um, because you've got an even temperature, fish will sort of feed at various temperatures or levels, depending on the oxygen level uh, and the, the, the temperature. Um, once you've mixed it, you get an even layer of temperature, which the fish don't like sometimes, and then they'll move away rather than um, stay there. Okay, I would just finally just on facilities here, you've got a really nice lodge here. Uh, so uh, the angler can come, he can bring his somewhere, his wife's allowed to sit and whatever, you know, is a, what sort of policy do you have? No dogs, no children, what's the, what's the rules here? Um, yeah, fa families are welcome because like I say, without the, the, the family, the, the, the husband or wife, whoever fishes out of the two may not be able to come along because it's a family orientated thing some, nowadays. Um, we don't allow dog walkers. Um, that is in, in the, the bylaws of the reservoir, um, but um, yeah, um, we get families come along. Um, as I said, it, it, it's all part of it, and, and when you get youngsters to come along, hopefully one day that they'll, they'll take up the sport of fly fishing, and it'll just be an ongoing um, sport. Well, Ivan, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. We've got people turning up all over the place here now. They want some fishing. They want some cast intuition. So I'll let you get back to your job as a, as a head ranger here. And I appreciate it very much. I thank you very much for your time. And I hope some anglers out there are going to come down and give Sutton Bingham Reservoir a try. Ivan, I'm sure we'll meet again. Thank you very much. As soon as I started to walk around the bank from the lodge, I came across an angler having a heck of a battle with a Sutton Bingham Biggie. But this was something different to a drought. It put an alarming bend in his fly rod, and that deep, dogged fight was more like a blackfin tuna than a rainbow trout. But what exactly was it? It looked like, well, a mirror carp. Well, that's a turn up for the books, isn't it? What's that, like a little buzzer? It's a buzzer. The buzzer. The buzzer. Took a buzzer. Yeah. Good girl. He's away, no problem. Whoosh. And just round the bay were other successful fly anglers, and these had some trout. 
That's it. So that's what that's what you're catching on, then, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've caught on the day. Yeah, that one was uh, fished on the sort of fast sinking line, popping off off the bottom like a little olivey booby. That one was on just sort of stripped back in on the slow sinking line. Got a bit more uh, streamer tail to that one, isn't it? Yeah, it? yeah, a bit of marabou tail for a bit of movement with a gold head to get it down a bit, and then. That one was on the floating line we just took, which was on the on the middle dropper on the floating line. Oh, a bit see. more, I suppose, proper fly fishing that one. But so you, you you generally you'd fish a team of three of these. You yeah. wouldn't fish these, would you, as a team, or do um, you? Or can I you? usually fish two of these, to be yeah, honest. A pair I have, of them, yeah. Have one about three foot away, and then another one about four foot. So it's sort of seven foot from the end of the fly line. Like, you and know? does it is it a matter at all? Uh, because I don't fish teams of flies, you know, so it's, it's different for me. Um, uh, will they take the middle one or the top yeah, one, or do they take, always take the take dropper? Take any of them, and I think sometimes with this, I fish another, you know, bit of more of a flashy one in front of it, and they might not necessarily take the first one. But then, if they leave it, then they see this one come yeah. behind it. They will hopefully so it turns nail them that on a bit. one. Turns yeah, them on a bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant! So that's the ideal. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. So that's a nice. It's a nice old bag of fish you got there. Tell us a little bit about it, how you yeah, caught them. It was a bit, bit slow to start with. Then uh, I think I had just being a bright day, went down on the bottom, just sort of twitching it in with a little green olive booby, and I've had a couple on that, just twitching it in. Sinking line then? Sinking line, yeah, we're just sort of like popping up off the bottom a little bit. Yeah. And then I've had a few more later on, just sort of pulling it back on a very slow sinking line. Sure. Again on like a green lure. And then finally, like the wind's got a bit better pushing it round made it a bit more nicer to fish the floating line and I've just sort of had him on like a I suppose like a greeny sort of dieback yeah. fish but they're, they're nice only a fish. Sort of stocky fish really but they've got some towels growing back and they've all fought really well they're all what two and a half to three stockies are they? yeah two and a quarter I mean, and stuff my mate he had a good start that's the sort of better ones you can get in here lately I've had a few nicer ones but not today he's had the Good him, but he's had the cream, but you got the bulk of it there. Yeah, but he's still got time. Yeah. So what's so, that brownie? You know, let's have a look at that. If you can hold him up, yeah. show the folks. He's show the folks funny, back home because we don't really see a lot top, of brownie. Uh, uh, fin on him, unfortunately. I did have one the other day. Like a, I did put him back because he's only about eight ounces, but it just yeah. proves that they're uh, breeding in yeah. That would have been a wildie or something like that, would it? Yeah, I, I think yeah, that little one was definitely bred in here. Yeah. But yeah, these yeah. are all just sort of like stocky. So what would a good brownie be? Well, if you had a, a real nice big brown oh, one? That's hard to say really. I mean, Fives, they go five, yeah, six pounds? Yeah, 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 yeah. But there is some, there's been, a, I think about nine pounds or so, the best fish. Oh, oh big year. fish then, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I've had some, a few four and five pounders down here this year, but yeah. not today. Good but, catch of fish though, nice catch of yeah, fish. Yeah, it's, like you say, it's not ideal conditions either, but yeah, it's usually excellent fishing down here early on. Well, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Right, Hope you catch you. some more. Right. Cheers. On my tour of the reservoir, I found an angler weighing in his catch from the big fish area. He had a really good bag of rainbows. You can see a uh, small this which goes you know, just a shade under four. So that'd be an average for that sort of fishery? Yeah, they're, they're, they're not any smaller than that in general, no. Um, a little bit bigger. Five and a half. Yeah. All from the same spot where you were fishing down there? In that corner of the yeah. dam? So you don't have to move around too much to find them, yeah? Um, just looking for what the fish are doing, you know, seeing the signs. Yeah, any movement. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's getting up there. Evans, is he? Whoa. No, I'm surprised. That's yeah, I thought that might have gone 11, I must admit, there you go. Yeah, I don't know how accurate the scales are, they've been there for donkey's years, but um, it's still a very good fish. That's a nice fish to catch, yeah. And what do you get all those on? Um, two of them I had on pheasant tail and two were on damselfly, but when I say damselfly, it's not a damselfly lure, it's a damselfly imitation. Yes. So there's another totally awesome fishing show exclusive to stir the blood of those fly fishermen that like the challenge of a big water. Even on a bright day, the trout were coming to the fly. 
and the setting is just superb. Of course, even if you don't want to fish, why not just kick out and chill in that warm summer sun? <laughs>